Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Benchamal, co-chair of the CCH CSP Curriculum Committee, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our first new CCH CSP webinar series, uh, Researchers Unmasked is what we're calling it, interviewing various teams of researchers engaged in pediatric research in Canada and the CCH CSP community and giving some of their secrets of success. It makes sense that the first team being interviewed for the CCH CSP webinar series is the, CC the team of the CCH CSP head, Dr. Susan Samuel. Susan is a pediatric nephrologist, clinician scientist at the University of Calgary and Alberta Children's Hospital, and a clinical and health services researcher. As you'll hear, she's engaged in a wide range of research from health services research using health administrative data to translational research using biobank specimens to a clinical trial of an intervention for transitioning adolescents with chronic disease. I'd also like to introduce my co-moderator for this se session, Dr. Mandy, Mandy Archibald from the University of Manitoba. Many of you may not know Mandy since she was away in Australia for a few years during her postdoctoral fellowship, but she's participated in the CCH CSP community for many years as a trainee and is now serving on the curriculum committee. Mandy, hi. Hi, thanks, Eric. Yeah, it's really great actually to be back and uh, to contribute to the committee after my years as a doctoral trainee. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to bring back an Australian accent, which is what I'd really hope for, but uh, or Extra the weather, training. apparently. Yeah, the weather, the, the accent, but uh, the training, the experience were, were obviously really great. So anyway, let's get started with a few ground rules for our opening session today. So we'll start with a brief introduction from Susan and from each of her team members. Um, and then we'll go over some pre-submitted questions that we put forward for the team. And we'll make sure to leave at least 10, hopefully more like 15 minutes for questions from the audience and since it's really about uh, you and as connecting with your experience. Um, so to do that, you can put your questions straight into the chat box. Um, you can target Linda on those questions and she can bring those forward for us or just put them out to the wider group. So Linda will monitor those questions for us um, or during the question and answer period at the end, feel free to raise your hand. Um, we'll call on you. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. So we'll start with a bit of an introduction then from Susan's team. So Susan, do you want to get started? Sure. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for joining us. It's such a pleasure to see so many of us on the call today uh, from uh, different uh, perspectives and um, different geographic regions uh, in this country. So it's really a pleasure to see everybody. And thank you for um, having a uh, uh, us on this uh, first webinar. Thank you, Eric and Mandy. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself and then my team members will each introduce themselves. So I wanted to tell you who I am and where I came from. Uh, so I came from the southwestern state of India called Kerala as a child um, to Canada and we landed in Vancouver. I showed you a map here on this slide and a little picture that's reminiscent of what it looks like in front of the home that I grew up. And it looks very much like that even now. Um, so I came from a small town in India uh, to Vancouver. I studied medicine and science at UBC and then went on to do pediatrics and nephrology at the University of Toronto. Uh, completed a master's of science in clinical epidemiology and then I was very uh, privileged to uh, have a job here in Calgary and that's where I assumed my role as a clinician scientist. Um, I learned the ropes, I found my way and I'm really grateful for all the training um, that I went through and the, and the position that I'm in and somewhere along the way I also <laughs> became the director of CCHCSP <laughs> a uh, career choice that I, I never even dreamt of when I was growing up, but I'm really, really privileged to serve in this way. I wanted to tell you what drives me and the reason why I'm here and the reason why we're sharing this session with you today is my fundamental belief that research needs to make a difference for patients and families. And I'll tell you why. Um, I showed you the place uh, where I came from. So generations before, uh, my father, um, our family has a familial kidney disease. So every, in every, and it was in every generation. So many members had died uh, due to an inherited kidney disease. And my father was the first one to survive beyond the age of 50 due to innovations in dialysis and transplantation. 
and of course, uh, because of universal access to healthcare in Canada. So we are very grateful. I have a brother who has intellectual disability and also the same kidney disease. And our hope for him is that he would have delayed progression to dialysis with all the wonderful care he is receiving. So I know for personally that encouraging clinicians to pursue academic and research careers is the hope that we have for a better future, better health for all of us. So I wanted to do something larger than myself. Um, I like to solve big problems, grand challenges. So um, I just put the names of a couple of the projects that I work on. One is the Canadian Childhood Nephrotic Syndrome Project, which is affectionately termed child nef. It's a national initiative to study nephrotic syndrome um, and to improve care and outcomes for children who suffer from it. And then the Transition Navigator Trial is, um, is a wonderful initiative to bring forward an intervention that would immediately help patients. So we are testing that intervention. There's a large team behind it. And I'm grateful to be part of both of these initiatives. So with that, I will turn it over to my teammate, to Laurel. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you can see me, um, even if you can't. Uh, so what's an MFA doing on a child health research team? Well, <laughs> I didn't start out that way. Um, this painting means a lot to me, this first painting, and we're reading right to, or left to right. Um, so it's the Daphne and Apollo, um, which is uh, uh, a Greek myth. And uh, um, my name is Laurel and da uh, Daphne gets turned into a laurel tree. My mother had this little tiny book on uh, Greek mythology that had all these classical paintings in the middle of it. And I saw this painting and it had Daphne being turned into a laurel tree and I saw my name and it got me very interested in fine arts generally, both um, visual and performance. But my uh, real love is performance. And so that picture was by Piero del Poleo, um, an Italian Renaissance painter. The next uh, painting for the those of you not familiar with it, is uh, I, I cut out one of uh, a series of paintings by Henri Matisse. Um, and uh, this just to me shows the excitement of performance and movement. And uh, so my actual master's is in dance history and criticism. And I wrote a thesis on aesthetics and whatnot. Um, the next, uh, I wasn't born in Canada. Uh, I came to Canada and the next painting is by a group of seven artists, F.H. Uh, Varley. And so I moved to uh, Ontario uh, to study at York University and do my MFA there. Um, I had a job after that in Canada, met and married my husband, who's, so I hooked a Canuck. Um, the next three paintings sort of indicate uh, my, uh, my three children that I had. Um, and these are by Cassatt and Melcher and Freer. Um, then we go on to the second row. And my youngest son was um, diagnosed with autism just before he turned three and life kind of came, became a Jackson Pollock figure uh, or painting. So um, there was not a lot of direction, not a lot of, and this was uh, uh, <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> All my children are grown and in their mid to uh, late 20s and 30. Um, so uh, at any rate, there was a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos, a lot of crises. Um, my son, uh, Daniel, is e extremely involved, <laughs> as we say, with his uh, uh, autism diagnosis. He has an intellectual disability and mood disorder and various other things. So the only... Um, uh, so I had to pivot, <laughs> and so you'll see that uh, I had to kind of move away from my fine arts background and uh, start figuring out what I what we were going to do as a family and what we were going to do specifically with my son. Uh, early on, uh, I was very privileged to be uh, co-coordinator uh, for early intervention. So I started meeting families who uh, didn't just have autism, but had other kinds of disabilities. Um, and over the next 15, 20 years, <laughs> 
I've been working pretty much uh, in in various uh, jurisdictions on uh, as a disability disability advocate um, and help, and then as family faculty in the states um, where they have actual people with lived experience or as I like to call them experience experts um, and uh, got very involved with uh, research and uh, teaching uh, graduate level students about uh, families experiences through various programs. And about in 2011, I started at the amazing Alberta Children's Hospital, which is my final picture there. Um, I've been in various uh, uh, positions since then and been working with Susan on and off um, since 2011. Uh, and uh, I left her for a couple of years to learn a bit more about research with a different kind of research team and uh, came back to, so I've been with her now since 2015. So, and very, very, very lucky, as you can tell from my <laughs> initial training that I am uh, in this position and I'm delighted to uh, to bring what, what gifts I have <laughs> to the team. And that's enough for me. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Monica Perrin-Panagam. I'd like to thank uh, CCHCP for giving us the opportunity to speak at this session. <clears throat> so um, I am from Sri Lanka. I grew up there and I moved to Canada to do my PhD in cell biology. Uh, and uh, my PhD focused on finding novel chemo chemotherapeutics to treat uh, B-cell lymphomas. I'm also a certified project manager. Um, I've, I have about 14 years of research experience. Uh, four of those have been in clinical research and the rest in basic science. Uh, my current position is that I am the program lead uh, for the child NEF research program uh, that Susan alluded to earlier at the University of Calgary. And the unique skill that I bring to this team is that I'm able to bridge the gap between basic science and clinical research. I'm very passionate about my family and my friends, and I care a lot about fairness, so equality is a big thing for me. Uh, I'm, I also love kids and I love science, so I'm very fortunate that I'm able to combine the two and um, be in uh, and find a career in, um, in uh, clinical research for pediatrics. Um, some of the fun facts about me is that I love to read. I collect quotes in this little book that I have. Uh, I'm a big entertainer. I love to have friends and family over, not so much because of COVID. Uh, and uh, I love to try out different foods from different cultures, uh, especially if they're spicy. And I bake a lot. And uh, I think my team can uh, attest to my treats. <laughs> uh, and I thought about what drives me to do research. And I love the patients and we do it for the patients, of course. But really for me, it is empathy. Um, my husband and I lost uh, a baby girl. Uh, she was stillborn uh, in 2015, and uh, that that um, that made me change my career from being a basic scientist to becoming a clinical researcher because I I felt like I needed more of the human experience, and uh, also um, I never wanted anyone to feel or a parent a parent or guardian to feel so helpless like we did when we lost our child. Uh, so um, before I end my, um, my presentation or my introduction, I'm going to leave you with a quote uh, by Audrey Hepburn about empathy. Uh, she says, nothing is more important than empathy for another human being's suffering. Nothing, not career, not wealth, not intelligence, and certainly not status. We have to feel for one, one another if we are going to survive with dignity. So uh, with that, I'm going to end my introduction and I'm gonna hand over to my friend, Ken. Thanks, Manika. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Pfister, and I am the research coordinator for the Transition Navigator trial. And as Susan alluded to, it's a study evaluating whether a patient navigator service will improve patient health and experience after their transfer to adult health care. So my background is I have a master's in epidemiology. Uh, I just graduated last year. And the reason I chose to pursue healthcare research is for the same reasons I'm sure many of you find yourselves here and for reasons that I'll echo that my team members have alluded to. And that's really the attempt to improve the health and quality of life of others, um, perhaps find better ways to treat or prevent disease and hopefully to contribute and advance knowledge in the field. Um, I chose to train in epidemiology specifically because beyond the necessary understanding of health research, study design, their various biases and statistics, is that it lends itself to a mindset of critical inquiry, which fosters an ongoing interest in learning that at its heart is dedicated to the health, safety, and welfare of others. And since we know that research achievements are rarely made in isolation. This type of work also allows you to work in a multidisciplinary environment, as well on diverse teams, such as the one I find myself on currently, and it makes it for a much more rich and rewarding experience. So a fun fact about myself, um, I suppose fun is debatable here, but a fact nonetheless is that I have an identical twin who is also an epidemiologist. And that's it for me. Great, thank you everybody. And I think we, we got everybody there, right, Susan? It's a big team and growing, I understand as well. Yes, that's, um, that's everyone. Great, and, and I, you know, I think what struck me, and we'll get started with some questions first, uh, sort of questions from us and questions from the audience that were submitted ahead of time, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience live. But I think one thing that struck me, Susan, is the, the sheer diversity of the team, right? You know gender, ethnicity, but most importantly, multidisciplinary science. Uh, can you tell me how you went about building such a, a fascinating, diverse and wide ranging team? Yeah, so we reflected on this a little bit as we prepared for this presentation. And I can be very honest that I did not have as rich an understanding of the value of diversity when I first started out as a junior researcher. Um, you know, the temptation is that we, um, populate our teams with people who are like-minded, who have similar training. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, I was not able to find those individuals. And with Laurel joining our team, over, and she has obviously been with, um, with the nephrology team at the University of Calgary for some time and, and more closely working with me for more than five years. Um, just the fact that she has a master's in fine arts and is a patient advocate she would ask me questions that was counterculture all the time. Uh, it, we we're always looking at the same thing, but she would always come at it from a different angle. And she would always hold me accountable for the patient voice. So she'll say, Susan, what about this is making a difference in patients? How will you explain this to patients? Why are you doing what you're doing? So these were the prevailing questions that started happening in our team about five years ago. And it's about that time I had a certain dawning in my own uh, mind that this diversity is what makes us special and what's going to make this research team go from just ordinary to extraordinary. So I started encouraging and fostering that. And finding Monica was also a step in that direction because I wanted somebody to help me stretch in ways that I wasn't able to stretch before into the basic science world where I had no training and no knowledge of. And so she assisted me to move in that direction. And I should also mention that we lead the, the transition navigator trial. I, I, I know, I think that Dr. Mackey is on the call. He and I are co-principal investigators for the trial, but we have a, another co-principal investigator who's a social worker. So uh, the addition of Dr. Dimitropoulos into our team really helped me understand better how social scientists think, how they do research, 
how we can implement interventions that incorporate that perspective. So we're able to stretch both into the basic science world and into the social science world, but I am neither a basic scientist nor a social scientist, but the solutions for the human problems that we're searching for lies in the collaboration. So just, uh, I, I would say I didn't build it by intent or design, but somewhere along the way, I had the understanding to value it. And therefore I kept fostering it. And that's the team uh, right now. We also have a statistician who is from Ghana, who is one of the top students uh, in her university for mathematics. We just happened to find her and she brings an incredible dimension to our team as well. No, that's great. And I think it's interesting you brought up the transition trial because I, I thank you. You've provided me a lot of advice as I plan a transition intervention study as well. And you sort of set the stage for us, making sure that we include a diverse team. And it's not just pediatric or pediatric or adult gastroenterologists on the team, but we actually are including a psychologist who's an expert in implementation science, Melanie Barwick as a co-PI. Uh, so I think, you know, we're certainly modeling after your diverse team as well. Do you think that that has helped you. Certainly you're saying that they challenge you in ways that you probably wouldn't otherwise be challenged, which is great for science. But do you think that it's helped you in getting grants? Does CIHR recognize the importance of a diverse team in, in conducting research? Absolutely. And uh, I'm sure Dr. Mackey can attest to this. When we wrote the grant, finding Gina as the person who wrote the social um, work intervention for um, the trial we planned, that grant went to CIHR and was fun. We got money on the first try and second try it was fully funded. And it was clearly because we had incorporated diverse voices, not just in the PI team, but also we had multiple stakeholders, patient partners, policy makers. And it was sure not easy to bring that team together and everyone thinking the same way and pulling in the same direction. So it did help for sure. That's great, thanks. Well, that's fantastic. And I'll just echo Eric's uh, sentiment. You know, I really appreciate this team sharing so much about yourselves, not just from a research skills standpoint, but because um, clearly you're all bringing something unique to the table but also in terms of uh, your values and your other skills, um, such as baking. Don't think that that didn't go unnoticed as I'm wishing this meeting was potentially in person. That would be fantastic. So um, just thinking, you know, also when we, when we talk about team building and team success, we tend to focus a lot on the, on the lead investigator, which is great, um, but clearly the experiences of the other team members are very important as well to ensuring team success and also the sustainability of the team. So I'd love to hear from the other team members as well. Um, Manika, Laurel, um, Ken, what it's been like for you working within such a diverse team. Who's going first? I usually go first because I'm <laughs> Take it on. I'm, I'm chatty. Uh, yeah. Um, so for me, uh, I tend to approach things from a different lens, uh, obviously. And I also um, try and uh, keep things light. So um, for me, working with science scientists, Sciency scientists <laughs> is uh, rather different um, because they don't come at things from a kind of artsy, as we used to say, artsy fartsy background. And um, you know, it's uh, it's good because I think we tend to balance each other out. I'm a bit more, uh, I'm a less a lateral thinker, um, <laughs> and uh, I think my team members help me to uh, focus. Um, definitely. <laughs> and uh, just kind of, uh, yeah, organize and uh, figure out better ways to, to uh, attempt things. Somebody yes. else. Yes. Um, so um, for me, um, I am the sciencey person. She's talking about me and Ken, I suppose. <laughs> uh, and uh, we, I mean, at least me, I, I am, um, uh, I, I think like a project manager, and for me, it's all about deliverables and all about the science. And really, people like Laurel uh, lighten the mood. 
and let, and help me not to be so serious about things. And really, she brings the patient voice. She reminds us always, like, what about what about what you're doing is for the patient? Like, she she keeps reminding us that, and I think that is very important. And she she makes us laugh, and she she just so like she is really the magic of our team. I always say that, and um, and Ken is so wonderful. She he is. Uh, he teaches us so much about, which teaches me so much about the epidemiolo epidemiology side of things. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I just love it. I love working in this team and we really appreciate each other. That's great. And not to put you in a box, Ken, because you know, for all I know, you could be an accomplished musician or artist as well as a traditional epidemiologist within the team, but you also bring that specific skill set. So have you worked in a team comprising non-epidemiologists in the past? And, and what's it like for you working in this team now? Um, well, uh, first of all, I should say that my experience has been relatively brief since I just graduated last year. And my career as an epidemiologist is really just starting, but I can draw upon my experience as a volunteer on other research teams, working as a research assistant and even as a student. And I would say that it tended to be a little epicentric um, if I wasn't working with epidemiologists directly or those that were in training. Um, it was with individuals with educational backgrounds that are very epi adjacent. So working, <laughs> working for this team has been a fantastic experience for me because of the diversity in the roles and the educational backgrounds. And as Manika talked about, just the lived experience of our team members. Um, I would say from an epi perspective, it's easy to get lost in the number crunching and you can start to see patients in terms of what they can provide for you. And that's their data. But working closely on this team and working with specifically a social worker who's actually providing the intervention for our patients, um, everything they do is through that lens. Um, the patient's always in mind, and this is informed by listening and establishing that connection with them. And from even um, someone like Laurel um, with her lived experience and sort of being the champion for the patient voice has kept that fresh perspective in mind. and. Um, really keeps the why of the work that we do front and center. So I think this goes a long way to contributing to a sense of personal satisfaction, but also a willingness to engage more so in discovery and learning as part of the team. That's great. There's, there's certainly a sense of openness across the team that I, I'm, I'm sure we're all sensing at this point and, and not to position epidemiology and the arts as dichotomies. And this is the, the point in my uh, introduction where I, I suppose I have a, a disclaimer, um, but some of you would know this um, and Laurel, um, you know, you know this as well now that because of my background as well of integrating the arts into scientific research. Um, when I heard about your background, I was really quite interested in hearing how that infiltrates, if at all, what happens with the, within the team. So how do you think that this background might help advance the goals of the research team? Well, um, thank you for the question. That's a, a very tough question <laughs> because it doesn't always just fit in there. Uh, it doesn't dovetail uh, necessarily very easily. But um, I think when uh, when we're in uh, even a Zoom, um, I, I have a background in looking at movement and trying to assign um, uh, effort or shape to the movement and how that works with um, what people are saying. So, I mean, we all know that there's body language and things like that. So um, I just have a bit more training in really paying attention to that. So I try um, to do that. And also because of my experience and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not a shy person. Um, so I, and because I'm, <laughs> <laughs> older than dirt um, and, uh, you know, kind of a generation older than everyone else on the team. I also uh, am more willing to uh, say things that are a bit uh, counterculture, <laughs> as Susan nicely put it, but are sometimes outrageous. And I'll take things to um, 
the uh, illogical extreme, um, you know, and just try and, you know, uh, point us in ways that, um, because, you know, my, my background in the arts and you know too, it's, it's experimentation. Right, um, and and in science, that's all they do is experiments, um, or not all, but you know, a lot of things that come out of science are happy accidents from you know trying uh, trying something different, trying you know a new way of looking at something, um, and you know, novel uh, chemo, sciency chemical thingies that Manica worked on. Um, obviously I have a rich background in science. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it really, even there, you know, it's looking for something new. So I think, you know, constantly tr trying to push the, the envelope, I guess we say, <laughs> and not being afraid to do that. Yeah. Can I just add one thing, um, just to kind of summarize, I, I like the question, and Laurel, you were getting to this, is that um, I would encourage everyone on the call to find someone on your team who has human factor genius, someone who really reads people well, who knows how to read emotions, how to read um, uh, thoughts, uh, how to read body language, because for us, this has been the most valuable asset in terms of running large teams. Uh, we run a national team and a provincial team. And I would say we take an incredible amount of time trying to understand and get to know who's who and what's what and what's their motivation in each of the, the teams. And often we, you know, we can talk about this in terms of conflict resolution. We reflected on this a little bit, is that it's that human factor genius that helps you resolve conflict because you can get to the root cause of problems. So if you have someone who's a very linear thinker who's so attached to the data and getting emotional about the scientific questions on the team, that's great. It will advance your career. However, it will not advance your relational career. So if you have someone like Laurel who sits back and just watches body language and tone and understands the root cause of people's uh, conversations and behavior, then I'm able to say, okay, yeah, thank you, Laurel, for that insight. Let's talk to them further. Or, and uh, we have this funny story where, um, I think Monica is gonna go into this a little bit, but where a couple of colleagues uh, on a national telephone call got into a little bit of a disagreement. And it was a national incident in, in, in pediatric nephrology. So we, we had to resolve that. And we resolved that by sending a, who we thought was offended a short video uh, about uh, a funny, funny video. And it immediately lifted his spirits and got him back on track. And hopefully we'll be able to welcome him into the collaboration again. So it's, I encourage everyone to find people who understand other people really well and will help you on that path. Thanks for that. Um, thanks for that, Susan. You know, I, I, that human factor genius, I really, I really like that. I think it's hugely helpful and, and potentially one of those overlooked um, critical ingredients, you know, for team uh, success. So, so I think that's great. And, and you've started getting into this, but I'm wondering if you could share with the group um, some of the other specific strategies that you have found useful um, in ensuring team cohesion um, and shared vision in light of the diversity that your team does hold. Yeah, and I, I think visioning, maybe I'll start with visioning and then we can go into um, how we keep the magic and or keep the relationships in the team. So another helpful thing that we did as a team was to actually get a business consultant to work with us. We had paid money for this. It was just a small team. We're only two or three people, uh, but vision is so important. So we, we, we got a consultant and he sat down with us and said, who are you and what do you wanna do and why do, you, what, why do you do what you do? And we visioned and came up with a, 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 a uh, a statement that said we solve childhood chronic disease and that kind of linked my nephrotic syndrome project as well as the transition project that's an aspirational goal we solve childhood chronic disease but we have that as a, as an aspirational goal and then we set out to how we're going to achieve that we also talked about what strengths do we have as a team that's different 
than other teams. So when we did our visioning exercise, things like altruism, transparency, integrity, um, uh, you know, being uh, of service to others, these types of things came right out on top for my team uh, and for myself. So that has helped us guide our team all this way. And we continuously remind ourselves about that visioning exercise and the vision. Why are we here? We are here to serve the patients because in research, the, the rewards are far and few in between. And in between is a lot of tedious work and you're waiting for that happy moment when you get uh, some sort of result that will make a difference. And many times in research, that result may never come. But, and then we have still, we keep our vision alive. For example, with childhood nephrotic syndrome, I have an aspirational goal that we want to find the pathogenesis of nephrotic syndrome. I know very well it may not happen on my watch, but I want to be very sure that I provide the shoulders somebody else can stand on 50 years from now and possibly find that solution. And hopefully many generations of kid, kids can stop getting prednisone for the treatment of nephrotic syndrome. So that's an aspirational goal. That's a vision I have. And I'm communicating that often with my team. And I tell Monica, for example, you know, the, the, the journey is tough right now. It's COVID, we're not recruiting patients. We're not getting the biosamples we need. We're designing an international trial that's taking its own time. But remember why we're here and we just keep going that way. Now to keep things moving in our team, especially during COVID when things are so um, difficult is that we remember to keep things light. And <laughs> with Laurel on our team, like Monica said, it's hard to take anything seriously. So we use humor uh, often um, hopefully it's not a cop-out, but we use humor to keep our team together and to just take it easy, chill, and take a step back. Okay, some things didn't work out. That's fine. We can understand why. Move on. Forgive each other. Forgive yourself and move on. So we use humor a lot. We take care of each other and we keep going that way. No, that's great, Susan. And I think, yeah, for sure, visioning, and you, you mentioned the importance of visioning, and especially doing a visioning exercise like that all together as a team must have really improved the cohesiveness of the team and make sure that you're all working towards the same goal. That being said, sometimes there's conflict, and you implied that and from a light perspective. But Monica, can you talk a little bit about um, some conflict that may have arisen in the team? You don't have to be too specific. Don't call anybody out or anything. But some conflict that arose in the team and how, how your team deals with the conflict when it happens? Yeah, uh, thanks, Eric. Um, our team is not without conflict, of course. Every team has conflict. But I would say our team has less conflict <laughs> than, uh, or I don't know. I don't really have a reference point. But um, I'm just, uh, I was going to share with you the, the story that uh, Susan uh, alluded to earlier on about um, the, the PI and how we, uh, the two PIs and how we solved that, um, that conflict by send, Laurel actually sending a funny video to them. Uh, and um, I think um, the, the most important thing in our team, uh, which causes us to have less conflicts, per, so to speak, is the open door policy. We are, we are a very open team. And uh, if something is bothering us, uh, bothering any of us, we just book or we just call the person and, and just talk it up. Uh, and, um, or I book a meeting with Susan and, and Laurel does, does the same thing. Uh, and so does Ken. So I think having that open door policy and also having an, a human approach. Yes, it is important that we reach our goals, our research goals. But we are all humans trying to work things out who have a life out, outside of research, might, which might be affecting our behaviors and so on. So we, um, so I think it's important to understand that and uh, work with that. And finding the root cause of any problem is the most important thing because we need to figure out how did we get here uh, and how do we deal with it? 
Um, and when new, when new members come on board, it's especially important that we set the ground rules. We tell them this is how our research team will operate so that, you know, they are not, um, so that we don't chastise them later on for, for not uh, doing things the way that we do things. Uh, and um, yeah, so I, I think, um, yeah, that's how we deal with conflict and we resolve conflict in our team, Eric. That's great, thank you, Monica. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's great. And it, I get the sense too from the team that really also what keeps you centered is this, is this real clinical application, this idea that the patient is at the center of everything that you do and that helps drive you through the conflict that you're facing. So I'd love to hear more about that. And, and Laurel, you started a bit of that discussion earlier, um, talking about your role in providing the patient's voice in uh, partially relation to your son, Daniel. Um, and I'm wondering if you could share a bit more about that and how the patient voice is integrated into the team's research. Thank you, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, for me, uh, because my son was diagnosed not at birth, but um, when he was almost three uh, and we had to wait a long time and, you know, there's, you know, so I've been through, you know, uh, some different uh, stages. Obviously, my son's 20, just turned 27 now. Amazing. I know I had him very young, um, but uh, he, uh, you know, having uh, been through and, you know, 20 some odd years ago, we didn't have very uh, a lot of evidence about what works. Um, and that was the thing I think I, I already said, you know, that got me into looking at research because um, previous to that, uh, you know, and, and I'm much more on the qualitative side because my goal is, and, you know, we started this as soon as my son was diagnosed, my husband and I uh, are well-educated, um, so supposedly, um, and uh, you know we're majority culture, uh, English speakers, all that kind of thing. And if we were having a hard time, what's it like for other people who's a single parent who is new to Canada, who you know is trying to figure things out? They come from a different culture; it's looked at differently. Um, so. Right away, we started um, trying to uh, support uh, people who were in maybe a more vulnerable position than we were even, although we felt very vulnerable at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think, you know, we, we were lucky um, that we had opportunities to do that. And for me, one of the biggest um, rewards I've had as a patient advocate and a kind of a program family faculty person um, is seeing people go uh, finding their voice, empowering others, other patients to find their voice because it's not all about my voice, <laughs> although I am pretty good. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, it's about uh, listening, finding people where they are. Um, and even, you know, in terms of conflict resolution, it's like, okay, so where is this coming from? Meeting people where they are and then, you know, um, having some back and forth and trying to figure out, you know, what's what's really the problem here. Um, sometimes that's, you know, just listing the facts. Sometimes it's giving them some emotional support so that they can move on past that. But really um, empowering others. And I've, you know, done some uh, courses over the years and whatnot in uh, how to empower others uh, to find their voice because the patient voice is often uh, sometimes uh, missing, even though there's a push to, to uh, include it these days. But, you know, how do you do that? Um, there's not, a, you know, we don't have a playbook. You know, here's, here's good things to do, you know, but how do you make it work for your project, for your team, for where you are, you know, um, so it's, and how do we include the marginalized or the underrepresented voices, I suppose, um, because, you know, everybody, uh, I also, you know, kind of feel like we need to have empathy for each other as team members and also for the people that we're trying to help. And if we don't listen to them, you know, 
maybe on a from a sciencey point of view, <laughs> um, you know, we can find out, uh, uh, you know, answers. But we also have to talk to the patients in order to get the samples to do the sciencey stuff um, that I'm not very good at, <laughs> or or not trained in. <laughs> That's great, Laurel, and, and thankfully the science of patient engagement is is moving along, you know, with this um, great ethos of, of the team that you're part of. And Susan, I'm wondering if you have any other reflections as well on, on this topic, um, potentially, you know, more around why it's important to you or potentially some of the lessons that you've learned through um, keeping the patient front and center in your program. Yeah, so I think it thinks uh, in terms of the patient voice, I think we as clinician scientists need to have patient advocates talking to us on a regular basis. Otherwise, we can get tunnel vision. So that's really good. Um, we wanted to talk about the unique horn idea uh, is that every member on the team provides a certain, um, so we brought the frog, is that sometimes, um, you know, People may laugh, but I think that it's very important to recognize uh, wh where the ideas come from. Sometimes the, the best ideas can come from a very uh, uh, unguarded question from a patient or even a patient advocate or another staff member. So the PI has to be ready to receive those ideas. And so we have to be ready to receive those ideas from the patients, from the stakeholders, from the policymakers, from our colleagues. Sometimes the best questions I have come from my colleagues just walking down the hallway. Um, so that's that's what I would really encourage everyone, you know, who is uh, on the call is really to be open-minded and, and to listen to the solutions may come from all kinds of places. So be open-minded and hear that and then bring that into the lab. And for me, um, just being anchored to the patient experience has provided a lot of uh, my own personal accountability and also it's helped me to stay in the game so that I don't give up and and that keeps me anchored to the cause all the time. Thanks Susan and I think we, we maybe have a couple minutes very quickly uh, to ask one more question and then I want to leave some time for the audience questions as well. Um, but sort of at this time in 2020, we can't really go without asking this question, obviously. COVID-19 obviously has presented tremendous challenges to all of us researchers, especially clinical researchers, um, but also our opportunities. Can you speak to some of these challenges that you faced over the past six months and maybe what opportunities have arisen? Yeah, so for sure, we have, uh, as a te both teams that I'm leading have been significantly hampered by COVID. We have almost no recruitment since March 13th, and everything we're doing has been stalled. Um, so we did, uh, we have had funding challenges as well in terms of the transition navigator trial, staffing challenges, um, recruitment challenges um, in both studies. But what we're doing to stay afloat, first of all, is to take care of each other, pay attention to mental health and well-being. I have uh, made it public to my team that I have lowered my expectations of their productivity or my own productivity because we're at home, we have children, we have other demands, and we're not at our best. So um, that's the first thing. So we reset our expectations. And if people need to take care of themselves, we always prioritize that. So we have a saying, put on your own oxygen mask first. There's no pretending that you're happy on the team. If you're unhappy, we, we will talk about it, take the time you need and, um, and then come back when you're ready. Um, then the other thing is just to be patient and wait it out. I have, you know, I've learned to let go of the control that I feel over these teams and let it slide. And you never know, and I had a conversation with Linda about this. Uh, my favorite uh, saying to myself is that time and chance happens to everyone. So we have to seize the opportunity. So we are seizing the opportunity by shifting in the transition navigator trial to look at some of the COVID related questions, how vulnerable children access or don't access care during this time. So that's a wonderful new grant we could write next year. So all is not lost and to stay positive and keep going. That's what we've been doing. Oh, that's great. And I, I have to say, I think Ken is probably in the best situation of everyone on the team, because if he's having a hard day, needing a mental health break, he can just get his twin brother to step in 
forum. I'm seeing a, a parent trap situation here. So Ken, has has Susan ever noticed that or not really? I'm kidding. But no. you don't, have to answer. <laughs> don't answer that. Okay. <laughs> So we'll, we'll open it up for questions uh, from the audience. And there was one submitted question a little bit earlier from Ori Scott. Uh, maybe the team can answer this question. And then if you have a question, please do either put it in the chat box and we'll try to get to it or raise your hand and then you can unmute and uh, open your webcam and ask the question directly. So Ori asked a little bit earlier, uh, I wonder if the team could be willing to share an example of a project that combined basic science with either social sciences or clinical epidemiology. Um, Monica, I think, do you want to take this one? Sure. Uh, actually, we do have a project like that. So thank you for asking that question. Um, so uh, ChildNEF was, um, it started as a clinical epidemiology project. Uh, so it is, um, we've built a registry uh, where we collect um, uh, the information from, or I guess, uh, the disease information from patients across Canada uh, who have nephrotic syndrome. Uh, and as time went on, um, so this started back in 2013. Uh, and um, in 2016, we actually started a biobank for our nephrotic uh, syndrome patients. Uh, so we are collecting samples from these patients before and after they receive treatments. So we are able to I guess, bridge the gap between, um, uh, between clinical research and, and, uh, and look, at, look, um, look at these patients uh, from a biological point of view. Uh, so we do have a project like that, or two projects actually, which integrate. Yeah, yeah. And, and, oh, sorry. I was just gonna add that we now have a uh, clinical fellow who's doing a MSc and she is finally, uh, we're asking the patients, we're interviewing patients to see, um, just to get some qualitative information that we can then analyze uh, about how uh, nephrotic syndrome affects the family. And, you know, so we have uh, uh, eight years to 18 years. So um, some of those will be caregiver answers, some of them will be patient answers, some of them will be together. Um, but it's, there hasn't been, uh, I don't think, uh, enough attention paid to um, the impact on the patient and their family. Uh, because uh, working in pediatrics, we deal with families uh, a lot of the time, um, most of the time maybe. And you know how that, how whatever the condition is affects, in, in my case, I got very interested in how it affects, uh, how autism affects siblings or uh, any condition affects siblings, you know, but at least we're starting with the patients and then we can brought, uh, branch out from there, how it affects caregivers, how it affects siblings, you know, and on and on. Yeah, and I wanted to add that one of the most interesting and most fruitful collaborations uh, we've had as a team is with uh, Tomoko Takano, who is a basic scientist, photocyte biologist, who has worked for 20 years to try to find uh, the reason why nephrotic syndrome happens in children. So now we have joined forces, and this has been one of the most fruitful collaborations in terms of a, a potential scientific discovery. I spend time in her lab. My team is helping her build the patient aspect of um, the science we're trying to do. So I encourage everyone to reach across the aisles and find uh, a scientist who's outside your expertise and to build teams like this. Really great examples of that boundary spanning work um, that you're all involved in. There's been another great question come in from Natasha Trahan that hopefully we can answer in the next five minutes. And this is a three part question, so stay tuned. Um, <laughs> so the question is, what are some current projects that you and your team are working on during this pandemic? How effective are your online meetings and what do you usually cover? Um, we are continuing our work for both of these projects, uh, admitting that recruitment is not um, going as we plan. We're meeting more often by Zoom. Um, and a lot of times we're meeting just to keep each other well to see how we are. 
Um, we have done a lot of things that we weren't able to do. For example, Monica has spent an incredible amount of time moving uh, contracts through for this uh, biobank slash basic science project. So it's now up and running at six centers across the country. So we got, we had time because of COVID to do that. And for transition navigator trial, we, you know, we kept uh, uh, talking through and thinking about what other things we can do. We put in some new research ethics applications and so on, but we're really just lying low and, and you know, having a more relaxed uh, atmosphere and trying to think and creatively uh, figure out how to go from here and also preparing for the inevitability that we may need to close some projects early. And we did think about that and how we're gonna deal with that. So this is how we're spending. I hope that answered all those questions, how we're spending this time. Susan, as a follow-up, so, I mean, people say being bored is a good thing, right? Being sort of not bored, but maybe less productive. Do you find that it's giving you more time to think and more time to come up with new future ideas for when the pand pandemic is done? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I'm on sabbatical now. I, 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 I would encourage everyone to have mini sabbaticals throughout the day. The, my best ideas come in the morning during that, when I'm really unguarded, I'm doing my wellness routine. Uh, any idea that I've had comes at that time. So I encourage everyone to incorporate more rest. And I, I just wanna say this out there, it might be counterculture again. I think the best science comes from the most rested mind. So it's counter to what you think. You work harder and harder to fill the lines on your CV but you could do that one impactful project that comes from a really rested creative mind that's going to make a big difference for you. No, that's great. And the only thing I can think of right now to say is I'll have to tell my wife that I need to rest more when I'm not at work because it'll help me work better. I don't think that will go over very well. No, no it's good that you tried that here, Eric. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> Everybody's yeah. shaking their head no. no. We're happy to come and talk to her. <laughs> 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 so, and, and Ken, how do you feel it's going with sort of things like reviewing data? So we find that in my group, we found that a bit challenging, um, you know, during COVID reviewing data online over Zoom and things like that. Do you find that that's working with the team? Yeah, I find that it's working. Um, it can be a bit tedious at times because it seems like that might be all that's left to do. Um, mm -hmm. But getting back to Natasha's question, we're meeting more frequently and going over things like these. And I would say that just because a meeting might not be as productive um, doesn't mean it wasn't effective. Um, sometimes just getting in touch and hashing little things out and just talking about our day, it really goes a long way. Yeah, no, I agree. And I find that a regular set meeting with the team you know, tends to motivate people a little bit more, right? Like it keeps people accountable subconsciously, even if it's not a firm accountability thing. It's, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, it makes people take that little extra step uh, to prepare, which is great. Yeah, exactly. So I don't think there are any other questions uh, in the last minute. So I think we will wrap up if that's okay with you, Mandy. That sounds great. And Susan and team. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for joining us for the first webinar. I think it went I think it went well, but we'd love to hear the audience feedback and, and hear from people as to whether they found this useful. Uh, the idea is that we are planning on making this a regular thing with various teams from across, you know, the CCHCSP community of researchers, but also outside. And hopefully you found it useful, but if you didn't, please let us know. We're open to the honest feedback as well. Just be nice about it. And uh, I don't know, Linda, do we want to announce the topic of the next webinar? Not quite yet. Yeah, I don't think we're there just yet, but hopefully we'll have it uh, shortly. Okay, and the plan is for January, right? We're not doing one in December. That is okay. the plan, yes. So January. the plan is we'll be back in January with a new and exciting team, hopefully. And, uh, you know, hopefully by then we'll have some new ex and exciting news, uh, news about vaccines, but we'll see how things go. And I just wanted to thank everybody for, for joining us. Thank you very much. And thanks to Mandy, Susan, Laurel, Ken, and Monica for joining us as well. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Love to all.